Hey, good morning, family of grace. Welcome to our online campus. If you're new here, if you haven't been here in a while, welcome. My name is Pastor Chris. I'm the online campus pastor here at Grace Central Coast. We are a gospel-centered, multi-campus church on the Central Coast of California. We are all about helping people find and follow Jesus. I'd love to know that you were here worshiping with us today. You can email me, chris at gracecentralcoast.org. I'd love to pray with you and your family. Um, And I'd love to hear from you and chat with you about any questions you have about the service. So you can email me anytime, chris at gracecentralcoast.org. Well, we're going to start off our time of worship together, uh, and really, we're going to start off our new year together by reading from God's Word and seeing how we've been called to worship Him. So let's do that right now as we read from Psalm chapter 9. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. Let's do that right now as we worship. Let's remember the great things that God has done. our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what your Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Let's remember, Hero.
the beginning One with God the Lord most high You're reading glory in creation Now we will you are Christ What a beautiful name Christ my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. Jesus, you
and God, that is our prayer this morning and in this new year as we go into a new year of worshiping you together as a church family. We pray that you are our vision, that you are our glory, you are our high king, you are our treasure. Lord, we pray that you would help us by keeping you, yourself in front of us in your word and through what you're doing through your people, Lord. We pray this as a commitment to you, Lord, that you would be our vision over ourselves, over our comfort, that you would be our vision and our hope in this new year and in today's service. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Good morning, Grace Central Coast. My name is Jess Jantos, and I'm the Women's Care Director here, and I'm so happy to be worshiping online with you today. Um, we're going to move into a time of giving back, and if you're new with us or you've forgotten, there are three easy ways to give, and you can find those on our screen now. Um, as we're doing this, I want to talk about one family and how they have given back through an incredible act of um, hospitality and generosity in the last year. So in September of 2020, we realized that our um, courtyard at our downtown Slow campus was not going to fit all of the people who were coming to our live services. And so Pastor Ken, Pete, and his wife, Judy, um, saw a way to be able to give of their property. And they, in September of 2020, opened up their property for um, our slow campus to start meeting there. And I don't think that any of us had any idea uh, what that would turn into. But over the last 67 weeks, we have had almost 500 people meeting each week on their property for church. Hundreds of kids have heard the gospel in our Grace Kids classes. 20 people have been baptized there. We've parked an average of 250 cars each week on every corner of the Pete's property, including their neighbor's lot. And it's been really incredible to see how God has blessed this campus through the generosity of um, Ken and Judy. One of the really amazing things that's come from this season has been hearing stories of people who have been driving in the area and heard our worship service going on. And they've driven around until they've found our church. And many of them have attended church for the first time. It has just been apparent that God has used this um, time of outdoor services at the Pete's property to bless. Um, and, and we're just so grateful for Ken and Judy and their hospitality. So would you um, now pray with me? Lord, we are so humbled by how you choose to work through even the smallest acts of um, generosity and hospitality and how you um, just can turn that into something greater than anything we could imagine. We thank you for Ken and Judy for their hours of work uh, they have put into their property to make it possible for this low campus to meet outdoors there. We thank you for all of the lives that have been touched there. Um, we just see your hand in all of it and we're just so grateful. So we pray that you would bless Ken and Judy um, as they now get a season of rest as we move back indoors, Lord. But we thank you for their, um, yeah, their hospitality. And we just give you this time now, Lord, as Pastor Tim opens the word and we dive into Hebrews again. Lord, would you just speak through him, give us ears to hear and um, hearts that uh, are transformed through your word. In your name we pray. Amen. So now if you'll turn with me in your Bibles, we're going to read our scripture. And today it is Hebrews 7, verses 1 through 10. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham appointed a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who receive the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. 
In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hey, welcome today. Thank you so much for worshiping with us at Grace Central Coast. Hey, I'm a, I know that some of you are worshiping indoors at new and different times at our five cities and North County campuses today. Some of you are worshiping at our online campus. Wherever you're worshiping today, thank you for your flexibility as we continue to pivot as necessary to accommodate COVID craziness and now winter weather. If you are a guest with us today, we're so glad that you're here worshiping. Uh, we hope that you experience a warm welcome with us. I don't know about you. I don't know if you are a Marvel movie fan or not, but there is no denying the wild popularity and financial success of these Marvel movies. And, I, and I, I'm convinced there are a number of reasons for that. For one, I'm convinced that all these Marvel movies, they tap our heart's desire for someone super who can make this broken world right. Second, I think all these Marvel movies are so smartly written and hilarious. I laugh every time. Third, these Marvel movies, they've created a whole universe of interconnected movies, 27 movies and counting, and now they've added at least five television series where characters, storylines, and symbols all link to one another across all this content. There are all these fun Easter eggs introduced in early movies that only hatch in later movies. I'll give you one example. I remember when I watched the original Captain America years and years ago, and uh, I learned about the Tesseract, this mysterious and powerful blue cube connected to Norse mythology. But I had no idea when I watched Captain America, I had no idea that the Tesseract would show up in at least 10 more Marvel movies in the years ahead. It's wild and fun, and there's never been another movie franchise like this. But there is a book like this, and it's called the Bible. Long, long before the Marvel Universe, there was the Bible. And the Bible, too, is full of interconnected characters, storylines, symbols, and Easter eggs that all link to one another and climax in the person and work of Jesus Christ. As we enter 2022, I've been reflecting on how passionate I am about studying and teaching the Bible and doing all I can to create and grow lifelong Bible readers. I really am passionate about this. I'm passionate because I love the interconnectedness of the Bible's universe and how it all leads to Jesus, how it all points us to Jesus. I'm passionate because I'm committed to helping people find and follow Jesus. And I'm convinced that we find Jesus and we learn to follow Jesus only as we read and understand the Bible. And that happens over a lifetime. I'm passionate because I've seen the impact and the life change that happens when someone commits themselves to reading and studying the Bible. I've seen this in my own life and I've seen this in the life of others. And I wanna see more of that impact and life change. As we enter this new year, I wanna challenge you to make a new and fresh commitment to read and study the Bible over the next 12 months. Take a step this year towards becoming a lifelong Bible reader and watch what happens in your life. To that end, right now, would you once again open your Bible to the book of Hebrews chapter 7. Grab that outline in your worship folder and take some notes. Let's st study the Bible together today. And let's see and understand one of the Bible's Easter eggs, the mysterious and magnificent Melchizedek. And that really is the way to think about this character in the Bible. He's a lot like that Marvel Tesseract. Melchizedek is an Easter egg. I'm convinced, hidden by God himself way back in Genesis 14, mentioned again in Psalm 110, 
and then highlighted and explained by the author of Hebrews to help us better understand the person and work of Jesus. Who is Melchizedek? Well, let's ask and answer that question and together see four ways that Melchizedek points to and prefigures the person and work of Jesus. And so we must begin with the strange story of Genesis 14, which actually turns out begins in Genesis 13. Here's the story. Abraham and his nephew Lot decide in Genesis 13 that it's time to go their separate ways because their flocks have become so large and so numerous that the land cannot support them both together. So Abraham gives Lot the pick of the land and Lot chooses the luscious valley to the east near Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham, meanwhile, stays in the more western region of Canaan. But it isn't too long until Lot is in trouble. In Genesis 14, a band of five kings attack and lay siege to the lands of four other kings, including the, land, the king of Sodom. And Lot, by now a rich man, and all that he possesses is taken captive by the attacking five kings. Word reaches Abraham that Lot, his nephew, has been taken captive. And so Abraham gathers the men of his household to mount their own attack and rescue Lot. Abraham strategically divides his forces and attacks the forces of the five kings by night. And Abraham wins the victory to free Lot and the four captive kings and all their possessions. But then a strange thing happens when the king of Sodom comes to pay homage to Abraham and offer him thanks for his rescue. Another king shows up on the scene out of nowhere, Melchizedek. And this is what we read in Genesis 14, verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. And that's it. Through just three strange cryptic verses, Melchizedek disappears out of the narrative and is only mentioned one more time in Psalm 110 before he shows up again in Hebrews 7. For every other significant character in Genesis, we are given a genealogy and a family background. We're told something of their birth and something of their death but not for Melchizedek. Melchizedek appears out of nowhere and then poof, he just disappears and is seen no more. And while strange, it's easy to conclude that Melchizedek is insignificant and meaningless, that's not true. Because it turns out Melchizedek is an Easter egg that points us to and prefigures Jesus. And this is what the author of Hebrews wants us to see. And this is what I want us to see together today. Today we're going to see four ways that Melchizedek points us to Jesus. Next week we're going to look again at Melchizedek and see how the priesthood of Melchizedek and Jesus is superior and supersedes the high priesthood of Levi. But today, we're going to focus on how Melchizedek really points us to Jesus. I asked around this week, I took my own straw poll, and I asked this question, what can you tell me about Melchizedek? And most people I asked, they said, not much, I got nothing. And I'm guessing that that's most of us, and that's okay. I don't care what you know about Melchizedek when you got here today, but I'm passionate about what you know about Melchizedek when you leave here today. So here are four ways that Melchizedek points to and prefigures Jesus. Grab that outline, take some notes, look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1 with me. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God. The author of Hebrews is telling us just what Hebrews 14 told us, and it must be noted 
because it's singular and unique. There are other, a whole bunch of other kings mentioned in the book of Genesis. Melchizedek, we're told, is king of Salem, which scholars agree is an early version of Jerusalem out of which David the king will reign. But Melchizedek is more than a king. We're also told that he is priest of the Most High God. Now, this is interesting because this is the very first priest mentioned in the book of Genesis. The very first priest mentioned in the book of, of the Bible, uh, the Bible as a whole. And remember, this is 400 years before the law, the sacrifices, and the priesthood of Levi would be given to Moses. So what does it mean that Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God? We don't know because we're not told. The author says it matter-of-factly, but we're left to wonder. But what's also striking and strange is that Melchizedek is both king and priest. Because throughout the Old Testament, these offices, king and priest, they're distinct and they're separate. In fact, there are no other king priests in all the Old Testament. Melchizedek is the only one. Let's keep going in the text and see what else we learn. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to, Abra and to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem that is king of peace. Melchizedek, did you catch it? Means king of righteousness. Salem means peace. And Salem is where Melchizedek rules. So Melchizedek also means king of peace. King of righteousness and king of peace. Now think about Jesus. In all this, Melchizedek points us to and prefigures Jesus. This is what the author of Hebrews is telling us. Jesus, like Melchizedek, is the king priest of righteousness and peace. Jesus, too, is a king and priest. And it just so happens Jesus is also prophet and judge. Jesus fulfills all the biblical offices. It's not just his, that his name is righteousness. Righteous is who Jesus is. Righteousness is what Jesus accomplishes and gives. And peace is not the name, is not the name of the place where Jesus rules. Peace is who Jesus is. Peace is what Jesus accomplishes and gives. Throughout this letter to the Hebrews, the author has been reminding us that Jesus is our exalted king, crowned with glory and honor and power, now seated on a throne at the right hand of God the Father, awaiting the final conquest of his enemies. Because of his perfect righteousness and his sacrifice of peace. Another word for righteousness is justness. Justice. Jesus is both just and the justifier of sinners. This is how Jesus makes peace between enemies, humankind and God, hostile and alienated from one another because of sin. Jesus, the righteous king, becomes our priest and offers himself to make peace between enemies. I remember I memorized 1 Peter 3.18 a long time ago. For Christ also suffered for sins. The righteous, that's Jesus, for the unrighteous, that's us, that he might bring us to God. It is because of his righteousness that peace must be made. It is because of his righteousness that peace can be made. This is why Melchizedek is so significant, because everything that Melchizedek was, Jesus is, and so much more. 
Melchizedek is the type and the foreshadow. Jesus is the actual. Jesus is the fulfillment. Jesus is the true and better. So let's see another connection and another way that Melchizedek prefigures Jesus. Jesus, like Melchizedek, is the immortal king priest forever. Now, wait a minute. Was Melchizedek back in Genesis 14, was Melchizedek actually and really immortal? Did Melchizedek really never die? Is he a king priest forever? Well, let's see what the text of Hebrews says, and then we'll see if we can answer that question. Look at it with me. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3. He, that is Melchizedek, is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. Now, listen up right here. There are pastors and there, and there are scholars that go so far as to conclude on the basis of Hebrews 7.3 that Melchizedek must have been a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. And we have a few of those, like the angel of the Lord who shows up on a few occasions. I can live with those who conclude that, but I don't think that's what this verse is teaching. So what is it teaching? I don't think that this is telling us that Melchizedek was actually, is actually immortal and still continuing as a priest forever but rather because of the way he is presented to us in the Bible with no mother, no father, no genealogy, no birth narrative, no, no, no death note, Melchizedek appears to us as virtually immortal. It's the way he's presented to us. Because of the strange way that Melchizedek is presented to us in the Bible, it's as if he were immortal and, pre, uh, and a priest forever. Uh, that's the way he looks to us. The way he is presented to us, Melchizedek seems immortal. But Jesus is actually immortal. Our king priest forever. And so in this way, Melchizedek points us to Jesus. We're going to talk about why this is so important in the next couple of weeks to come. But today, I want to just jump ahead to see one more verse that says this same truth, but differently. And I love it. Uh, ahead in Hebrews 7, verses 15 and 16. When another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, that's Jesus, who has become a priest, I love this phrase, by the power of an indestructible life an indestructible life. They tried to destroy the life of Jesus. It didn't work. They couldn't do it. Jesus arose from the dead. His life is indestructible. That's what it means to be immortal. How can we know that we've got a forever high priest in Jesus who always lives to make intercession for us, who is always pleading our case before the Father? How do we know? His life is indestructible. It means his perfect offering satisfied the wrath of God. The debt was once for all time paid. Our sins are really washed away and forgiven. It is finished. That's what the resurrection of Jesus proves and means. Melchizedek appears immortal and a king priest forever. Jesus really actually is. So here's a third way Melchizedek points to and prefigures Jesus. Jesus, like Melchizedek, blesses all who, like Abraham, look to him. What happens when Abraham meets Melchizedek? You remember, first Melchizedek brings out bread and wine. He prepares a table before Abraham. Many have seen here a foreshadow and a symbolic illusion to the communion table. That's interesting, and it could be, but the author of Hebrews doesn't touch that. What the author of Hebrews does highlight is what comes next. Melchizedek blesses 
Abraham. Did you see it was noted in verse one? For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Abraham, do you remember, is the father of the Hebrew people and the Jewish nation. And as such, he's seen as really the top dog, the most superior figure in all Judaism. And all through the Abraham narrative, we see Abraham blessing other men and women. But Abraham is, himself is only blessed by God, except here when he meets and is blessed by Melchizedek. What is going on here? Abraham is looking to and submitting to Melchizedek as his spiritual superior and authority. This is confirmed when we see what happens next and Abraham pays tithes to Melchizedek. He gives him a tenth. Abraham understands that the blessing of the Most High God is coming through Melchizedek the priest of the Most High God. So look at verse, at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 7. It says this, It is beyond dispute that the inferior, that's Abraham, is blessed by the superior, that's Melchizedek. The author of Hebrews highlights the superiority of Melchizedek over Abraham in this blessing scene to show that the priesthood of Melchizedek and Jesus is superior to the priesthood of Levi. We're gonna talk about that more next week, but we got our hands full this week. Today, I want you to see what I'm trying to show you is the Jesus connection. Abraham looked to Melchizedek, the king priest of righteousness and peace, and he was blessed with the blessing of the Most High God. And so it is for you and I. So it is for all who will look to Jesus, the true and better King Priest of righteousness and peace. All the blessings of God come to us through the person and work of Jesus, the King Priest, if we will look to him. Ephesians 1, do you remember? We've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We've been chosen by God, redeemed by his blood, adopted into the family of God, and we've been sealed with the spirit for an inheritance yet to come. These blessings all come to us through Jesus and so many more. Righteousness and peace. Remember, these are what we need. These are what our hearts long for. Justice in this broken world and to be justified ourselves before a holy and righteous God. But we don't always know that, that our hearts long for these things. We, dis, we, we misdiagnose our own hearts, our own human condition. Righteousness and peace, these are what we long for. And they're only found in Jesus, these blessings. One of the things that strikes me in Genesis 14 is Abraham's response to the king of Sodom. Abraham has just rescued the king of Sodom and in return, the king of Sodom offers Abraham all the possessions that he rescued. But Abraham refuses to receive anything from the hand of the king of Sodom. Why is that? Well, Genesis 13 tells us that the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. And so Abraham, as he responds to the king of Sodom, he says that he has made a commitment to the Lord God Most High to not take even one thing from the king of Sodom, lest the king of Sodom say, I have made Abraham rich. Abraham, he's looking to Melchizedek, God's king priest alone for his blessing and his future. Abraham refuses to look to the world. And this made me ask, it made me stop and ask, where do I look for my blessing and future? Do I look to Jesus, my king priest? Or do I look to the world? Or do I look a little bit to both, to Jesus and to the world? Well, if I'm honest with myself, I probably do look to both, depending on the circumstance and the situation. 
And we know that Abraham at times too looked to both, but not here. Here, Abraham refused to look to the world for blessing and for his future. What about you? Where do you look? Where will you look for your blessing and future in the year 2022? Will you look to yourself? Will you look to your job, your profession? Will you look to the world's get-rich-quick schemes? Will you look to politics and politicians? That 2022 election is right around the corner. Brothers and sisters, look to Jesus. Fix your eyes and your hearts on Jesus. For in Jesus alone is our blessing and our future. Jesus has blessed us. And Jesus will continue to bless us as we look to him. Remember, this is the great challenge of the book of Hebrews. And it's our great challenge, too, on this first Sunday of 2022. Make a decision. Make a New Year's resolution to look to and trust Jesus this year before and above all lesser things. And then watch and wait for the blessing. But beware. The blessings that Jesus gives may not be exactly the blessings that you ask for or expect, but you will be blessed if you look to, if you seek, and if you trust Jesus. Make a New Year's resolution as we enter 2022 together. So how does Abraham respond to the blessing of Melchizedek? This is wild. Do you remember? He tithes. To Melchizedek. He gives him a tenth of everything right off the top. He will not take anything of the king of Sodom's battle spoils for himself, but he will gladly give the first and the best of the battle spoils right off the top to Melchizedek, the king priest of the Most High God. Look at the way verse 4 says it. See how great this man was, that's Melchizedek, to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. And this is the fourth way that Melchizedek points to and prefigures Jesus. Jesus, like Melchizedek, is worthy of our first and best. Jesus, the righteous king, has become our priest. Jesus has given himself to us to forgive our sins, to declare us righteous, and to make our peace with God. Jesus has blessed us beyond measure. All that we have is from him and through him and comes from his hand. And so is it not fitting that we would give ourselves back to him? Jesus is worthy of our first and best the first and best of our time, our talents, and our treasure, all that we have, the first and the best of our attention and our thoughts and our affections and our love and our hearts, not our leftovers, not the dregs at the bottom of our coffee cups. No, Jesus is worthy of our first and best in response to his great blessing, in response to all that he's done for us. He's worthy. So I want to challenge you on this first Sunday of a new year. I want to challenge you to some next steps today. They're printed right there on the bottom of your outline. Here they are. First, ponder. On this New Year Sunday, the Lord's Day, take some time to look to Jesus and ponder and give thanks for the many blessings he gives. Just ponder. Second, ask. How can you practically give your first and best, your time, your talents, your treasure, your attention, your heart, your focus, to Jesus in 2022 because Jesus is worthy? And and I have a little challenge here. Write something down. I just think that that's powerful. So uh, ask, what what would it look like for me to give my first and my best to Jesus in some really practical ways in 2022? I hope you'll take those next steps today and this week. So we've asked the question, who is Melchizedek? 
brothers and sisters of grace, as we seek to become lifelong Bible readers so that we might find and follow Jesus, we've got to know who Melchizedek is. You might not have known when you got here today, but I hope, I hope that you know as you leave here today. Melchizedek points to and prefigures Jesus in a whole bunch of ways. Melchizedek, the king priest, is the king priest of righteousness and peace. Jesus is more and better. Melchizedek is the mortal king priest forever. Jesus is more and better. Melchizedek is he who blesses the one who looks to him. Jesus is more and better. Melchizedek is the one who is worthy of our first and best. Jesus is more and better. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you are more and better. We fix our eyes on you together now as we step into a brand new year. Because Jesus, you are worthy of our first and best. We determine together to seek our blessing and our future in you in this new year. Help us do that. Show us what that looks like. Our hearts turn to other things. We seek our blessing and our future in ourselves and in the world. We look to the world. We want to look to you in 2022. We thank you that you are our true and better Melchizedek. And so we commit this year to you together. We commit ourselves to these next steps to ponder your blessings and to offer you our first and best. Help us, our king priest of righteousness and peace. We ask you to help us. Amen. Well, hey, thank you so much, Pastor Tim, and thank you especially for those next steps. I couldn't help but notice that those next steps go really well with the next step from last week. If you haven't seen that message, you can watch that right now at gracecentralcoast.org, where you are, or on YouTube. And uh, I would love to see those if you do that activity with your family where you look pat back at this past year and then look forward to this next year. You can send those to me, chris at gracecentralcoast.org. Also, if you have any questions about the service today or you just want someone to pray with you, I would also love to hear from you, chris at gracecentralcoast.org. Uh, with that, why don't you stand wherever you're at? We're going to read with and to each other our benediction as we send each other off into our week. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Have a great week. Hi kids, I'm Dory, the Kids Ministry Director at Grace Central Coast. Today we're going to sing some songs, listen to a Bible story video, and hear questions from kids. So let's get started. Knock, knock. Who's there? Figs. Figs who? Figs your doorbell. It's broken. Hey kids, it's time for sing-along songs. The part of the show where you sing along while we sing a song. And today I've got a special treat for you. What's that? Well, it's a song called The Sing-Along Song. What? I know. Your mind's going to be blown. That's crazy. All right, it goes like this. This is a song you can sing along. Just make sure you don't get the words wrong. It's super easy. Just follow along and sing the words with me. Bureaucratic, Adriatic, cryptocurrency. Annabella, Parabellum, Laryngoscopy. Ethnogeographical Michelangelo Intermittent aberration Elongated toe That was a song That's already half gone The second part you just Sing along Just remember your training and fall in line And sing along with me Maharaja Sectum Sempra Macedonia Disambiguation Mycoplasmatasia Countertops Triceratops Megalomaniac Anchorman Afghanistan Habakkuk Hackmatak
Moses led God's people from the Red Sea to the wilderness. They were hungry, so they complained to Moses. We wish we had died in Egypt. At least there was food to eat, they said. You brought us out here to starve. But Moses had not brought them out there to die. God was in control. God's glory appeared in a cloud and said to Moses, I've heard the Israelites' complaints. Tell them, in the evening you will eat meat, and in the morning you will eat bread until you are full. They will know that I am the Lord your God. Sure enough, quail came into the camp in the evening. In the morning, fine flakes like frost were on the ground. What is it? The Israelites asked. Moses said, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. The Israelites called the bread manna, which means, what is it? God told the people to collect just enough to eat for the day. If they collected too much, the leftovers went bad. He told them to collect twice as much on the sixth day, because the seventh day was the Sabbath, a day to rest. The Israelites did not always follow God's instructions. Sometimes they collected too much manna, and sometimes they tried to collect manna on the Sabbath day. God provided for his people, and he wanted them to trust him and obey him. The Israelites ate manna for 40 years, the whole time they were in the wilderness. The Israelites moved about the wilderness as God told them to do. One day they came to a camp with no water. Give us something to drink, they told Moses. Why are you complaining to me? Moses asked. The Israelites had forgotten that God was with them and had a plan for them. You brought us out here to die, they said again. Lord, what should I do? Moses cried out. God showed Moses a rock and instructed him to hit it with his staff. Water came out of it and the people drank. It was a sign that the Lord was with them. God provided water and manna for his people's physical hunger. Later, he provided his son, Jesus, for our spiritual hunger. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, John 6, 35. The Israelites needed bread to live for a little while, but whoever has Jesus will live forever. Hi there, I'm Pastor Kevin. It's time for questions from kids. Gianna from Portland, Oregon asked, Why did God's people want to go back to Egypt where they were slaves? Oh, that's a good question, Gianna. Uh, one of the reasons that the people wanted to go back to Egypt where they were slaves were, is that they were afraid. You see, oftentimes when the Lord is, is calling us from one place to another, we often get fearful. And so one reason was they were afraid. Uh, another reason was uh, their hearts were just being disobedient. God had given them clear instructions, clear directions on where to go. And in their hard and disobedient hearts, they preferred to do what they wanted to do instead of what God wanted to do. Another reason is, I think they were kind of satisfied with uh, Pharaoh's provisions, Satan's provisions. They had been taken care of good, so they thought. But what they did not know is that the Lord was faithful. They had forgotten about his faithfulness. So a fourth reason I believe, Gianna, is they simply forgot about how faithful and loving and kind the Lord was. So they were, they were disobedient, they were hard-hearted, they were slightly satisfied with what Satan was giving them, and they did not trust the provisions of the Lord. We must remember all the things the Lord has done for us. It's often good to talk to our Sunday school teachers and adults and trusted family members and friends to, to kind of hear from them what the Lord has done for them. A question I have for you is, do you ever forget all God has done for you? How can you remember? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your path. All right. All right, so let's try it together. You guys sing along at home. 
And uh, this is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Ready? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. Good times, good hanging, good lessons, good friends, good hats. We'll see you later. We're so glad you joined us today. Again, I'm Dory, the Kids Ministry Director at the Slow Campus. Our Kids Ministry team at Grace Central Coast is committed to helping your kids find and follow Jesus and committed to helping you disciple your kids. For further resources or to contact us, go to gracecentralcoast.org. Have a great day.